Okay, I'm back. <laughs> Hello out there. Thank you. I think everyone has been served. We're a couple minutes behind on our schedule. I want to get you out as soon as we can. We try to get you out just a few minutes after nine. We'll accomplish that. Quick, quick story. Uh, some 20 plus years ago, my wife and I attended a layman's conference in Tennessee. And we had a, a two day conference. There were a lot of well-known speakers, well-known musicians and singers. We really looked forward to it. And on the second day, they introduced a young man to come out on the stage to sing. And I turned to my wife and I said, who is that? He sang two songs. He left the stage with over 2,000 people on their feet, clapping and cheering a standing ovation. And I turned to my wife again and I said, who is that? Well, that was Brian Arner. Brian and I met a short time after that. Uh, we don't see each other too often. Once in a while, I think this is the third time that Brian has been to this breakfast for us. He's a good friend. Our friendship has increased over the years. He hails from Atlanta, Georgia. We're glad to have him with us. He's going to sing for us again right now. Thank you.
For our Old Testament reading this morning, the owner of Perfect Presentations, Dan Montrack. This is a reading of Psalm 33, verses 12 through 22. How blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen to be his special possession. The Lord watches from heaven. He sees all people. From the place where he lives, he looks carefully at all the earth's inhabitants. He is the one who forms every human heart and takes note of all their actions. No king is delivered by his vast army. A warrior is not saved by his great might. A horse disappoints those who trust in it for victory. Despite its great strength, it cannot deliver. Look, the Lord takes notice of his loyal followers, those who wait for him to demonstrate his faithfulness by saving their lives from death and sustaining them during times of famine. We wait for the Lord. He is our deliverer and our shield. For our hearts rejoice in him, and we trust in his holy name. May we experience your faithfulness, O Lord, for we wait for you. Thank you, Dan. And for our New Testament reading this morning, the new head football coach of Lindenwood University, Jed Stugart. Thank you, Ben. I know people are curious of a football coach reading from the King, Jer King James Version, but we're going to get this done here. So, appreciate it. Out of 1 Timothy 2.1.6, Therefore I exhort, first of all, the supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Thanks, Jed. And for a special patriotic reading, sales manager from Spectrum Reach, Mike Elam. through a county courthouse square on a park bench an old man was sitting there I said your old courthouse is kind of run down he said no it'll do for our little town I said your old flagpole is leaned a little bit and that's a ragged old flag you got hanging on it he said have a seat and I sat down is this the first time you've been to our little town I said I think it is he said I don't like to brag, but we're kind of proud of that ragged old flag. You see, we got a little hole in that flag there when Washington took it across the Delaware. And it got powder burned the night Francis Scott Key was watching it writing, Say, can you see? And it got a rip in New Orleans with Packingham and Jackson tugging at its seams. And it almost fell at the Alamo beside the Texas flag, but she waved on, though. She got cut with a sword in Chancellorsville. She got cut again 
at Shiloh Hill. It was Robert E. Lee, Beauregard, and Bragg. And a south wind blew hard on that ragged old flag. On Flanders Field in World War I, she got a big hole from a Bertha gun. She turned blood red in World War II. She hung limp and low a time or two. She was in Korea and Vietnam. She went where she was sent by her Uncle Sam. She waved from our ships upon the briny foam, and now they've about quit waving her back here at home. In her own good land, she's been abused. She's been burned, dishonored, denied, and refused. And the government for which she stands has been scandalized throughout the land. And she's getting threadbare, and she's wearing thin, but she's in good shape for the shape she's in. Cause she's been through the fire before and I believe she can take a whole lot more. So we raise her up every morning. We take her down slow every night. We don't let her touch the ground and we fold her up right. On second thought, I do like to brag cause I'm mighty proud of that ragged old flag. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Well, seven years ago, I believe it was, my wife Carol and I were invited to, by one of our congressmen, to come to Washington, D.C for a two-day program led by a guy named David Barton. And I must confess to you, I was not aware of David Barton at that time. I'm certainly aware of him now. We accepted that invitation the first day. Uh, David and his wife, Cheryl, who is with us today also, uh, gave us a tour of the Capitol building. It was absolutely incredible if I could use the words blown away, that's exactly what we were, to walk through our capital and for David to talk about all the history there and talk about the founding of our nation. The second day was spent with many of our representatives and senators and speaking and we got to interact with them somewhat and of course David did some speaking that day also. It was an incredible two days. This gentleman speaks to four, 500 groups a year. We are very, very fortunate to have him with us today. Please welcome David Barton. Thank you, guys. I'm going to do a whole lot visually, so make sure you're comfortable looking at, at screens. But we're going to start there. Since this is a prayer breakfast, I want to give you a little history of prayer in America, prayer breakfast in America. To do that, I want to go back to the American founding. Uh, there's a guy named Jed. Jed Morris is one of the historians of America. He's considered one of the top three educators. As a matter of fact, he wrote the history of the American Revolution. And as a historian, I want you to see what he says is the purpose of history, or at least the purpose of a historian. He gave these points. The historian is affairs. Should I take this one? Let me take this. We'll go to this one. He said the office of historian is to record the progress of human affairs as directed by the providence of God. Not the first requirement for historians today, but this is old school. Show what God was up to. He said, second, to exhibit the connection of events showing how an immense series is produced as cause and effect. The certain ideas have certain consequences. There is a cause and effect. There are results. He said, third, to display the character of man and the character of God. Now, that's the office of a historian. But I want to take the first part they talked about to show the providence of God. 
When you talk about the providence of God, you're still talking about history, but you're talking about what is now called providential history. We teach American history today with a very secular perspective. We don't show what God was up to or that God gets involved or that God has a plan. Sometimes he overrules the counsels of men to do what he wants. We don't look at history that way anymore. And so it's just a series of days and places and events for us where it used to be what's God up to. And I want to show you one example of providential history. I want to take you to Abraham Lincoln for a moment. Abraham Lincoln, when he became president of the United States, he left Springfield, Illinois to go to the Capitol. He was talking to a, a clergyman and he was remembering back to that time. This, is, this happened about, uh, about four years, uh, about the time of the second inauguration. He's talking to this Illinois clergyman. He said, you know, he said, when I left Springfield, I asked the people to pray for me, but I wasn't a Christian. He says, and when I buried my son, Ted, the severest trial of my life, he says, I wasn't a Christian. He says, but when I went to Gettysburg, he said, and at Gettysburg, when I saw the graves of thousands of our soldiers there at Gettysburg, he told this minister, he says, I then and there consecrated myself to Christ. Yes, I do love Jesus. So he says Gettysburg is a turning point in his spiritual life. Now, I believe that's right, because if you look, for example, what happened at his second inaugural, the second inaugural address that he gave, which is inscribed in stone inside the, the Lincoln Memorial, is one of the most spiritually profound speeches you'll ever read from anyone, much less from a president of the United States. The spiritual maturity, the spiritual perspective that is in that address, it is, it is profound, it is challenging, it, it is worth reading for Christians today. So there was a change in him, but interestingly, he was a big guy into prayer. He thought prayer was very significant. Matter of fact, this is one of his national proclamations he issued. We're very blessed at our organization. We own about 100,000 documents from before 1812. So I own thousands of the handwritten documents of George Washington, Adams, and Jefferson, etc., and thousands of documents and thereafter. And this is one of Abraham Lincoln's proclamations. Now, this particular proclamation has, happens to be for a day of humiliation, fasting, and prayer. Don't get many presidential proclamations on that anymore because Americans don't really do that like they used to. But this is a day of humiliation, fasting, and prayer. And this is one of the most famous fasting proclamations in American history because of the content that Lincoln put in here. And explaining to the American people why we need to pray and fast and humble ourselves before God this is what he said. He says, we've been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We've grown in numbers and wealth and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we've forgotten God. He says, we've forgotten the gracious hand that preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. He says, intoxicated with unbroken success, we've become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. He said, it behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. Now, this is in the midst of the Civil War, and he's calling on the nation to do Second Chronicles 7.14, to humble themselves, to pray, to seek his face, to turn from their wicked ways. So this proclamation happens at that point in time. Now, I want you to see from a providential perspective, this is history like you haven't been taught it, but it is history nonetheless, let me show you what providential history looks like. This is from a, a TV program. I want to do a lot of national TV programs. This is one. Watch this little two-minute clip and, and see how this works out. Okay. Talking about um, Abraham Lincoln, the change in him, Gettysburg. He he really um, he says now now I am a Christian. Now I get it. Um, and I don't know. How many of us can really say that? I mean, we can all say we're a Christian, or we can all say, you know, oh, I believe in God. But how many of us can say, no, no, no. After all these tragedies, I still didn't get it. Now I get it. Mm -hmm. And he calls people to fast and pray and says, this is it. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. What happens? I'll show you. This is a timeline of the major battles of the Civil War. Now, there's a lot of other minor battles. You got Pea Ridge, you got uh, Stone River, you got all these other battles. But let me show you, as the Civil War progresses, how the Union was doing. Uh, the Union 
won Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. They won Shiloh. And that's it. Everything else belongs to the Confederacy. Then they get over here. They win Gettysburg. They win... Wait, wait, where does, where does the thing happen? Where does the... Come back to that. Okay. Vicksburg. They win Chattanooga. Uh, they lose Spotsylvania Cold Harbor. They win Petersburg, Richmond. They win on Sherman's March. They win Atlanta. They win Mobile Bay. They win Nashville. They win Appomattox. And that's the end of the Civil War. Now, pretty clear difference. That's where he had the National Day of Fasting and Prayer. Right there. That's before. That's after. That is a providential view of history. What if God gets involved in the affairs of men? What if things happen with prayer? And, and so we believe that from the very beginning. And, and so that's why we taught history by not leaving God out. We looked at things that God was up to. And that was part of the way we taught history because that is one of the forces throughout history. Matter of fact, if you go back to the American Revolution, uh, the first time our founding fathers got together was in 1774 in the First Continental Congress. Now, interestingly, there was something that went on for 40 years leading up to the First Continental Congress. It was a spiritual movement. It was called the First Great Awakening. First Great Awakening lasted from 1730 to 1770. It was a major national revival. Probably the most notable figure in that revival is George Whitfield. Now, George Whitfield, this is a big deal for him. George Whitfield, in, in that 40-year period of time, he had 34 years where he traveled America preaching. In that period of time, he preached 18,000 sermons. And it is estimated that 80% of Americans physically heard him preach a sermon. Now, you imagine how many communities you have to go to for 80% of Americans to physically hear you preach a sermon. He was all over the nation, made seven trips on horseback from Maine to Georgia and back and forth. Just unbelievable what the guy did. And... His preaching over that period of time had a huge impact, and, and it's interesting, his father Abraham's sermon may have had the greatest impact on America. We rarely hear about it today, but if you look at the Founding Fathers, you have Ben Franklin that talks about how important that sermon was. You have Thomas Jefferson talks about that sermon. You have John Adams who talks about that sermon. Matter of fact, John Adams wrote Thomas Jefferson and said, Man, I remember several times hearing Whitfield preach a sermon. And I always remember when he would preach it, he, he would raise his hands up to the heavens. And the sermon was real simple. What happened was, in that time in America, by the way, Christians didn't get along well at all. They killed each other. If you happen to be in Virginia where the established church was the Anglican church, they killed Quakers because they weren't Anglicans. And they threw the Baptists in prison and they threw Methodists in prison and they fined the Presbyterians. And, and so, you know, America, this, this Christian nation can't get along with other Christians unless you're from, from my particular group. And so what happened, Abraham, uh, Father Abraham's sermon, George Woodfield said, he had this, this dream where he died and he went to heaven. And at heaven, Father Abraham made him to the gates of heaven. Now, he, he's a Methodist. He's, he's one of the founders of the Methodist Church. And he says when he got to heaven, Father Abraham met him there. And he said, I am so glad to be here. He said, I can't wait to meet my Methodist brethren. And Father Abraham looked at him and said, uh, I'm sorry. None of the Methodists made it to heaven. There's no Methodist in heaven? Well, at least I can meet some of my Presbyterian brothers. Uh, sorry, none of the Presbyterians here. There's no Presbyterians? Well, at least the Baptists. He went through every denomination. Father Abraham said, they're, they're not here. And so finally, George Whitfield asked Father Abraham, said, well, who's here? And the answer Father Abraham quoted to him was out of Acts 10.35, where it says, He that feareth God and worketh righteousness shall be accepted of him. The only people that made heaven were those who feared God and did what he wanted. We don't have any denominations here. And so he went across America at a time when America was broken up by Christian denominations saying, Look, all God wants is people who fear him and work righteousness. Now, Whitfield died in 1770. He died in, in Springfield, well, up in Massachusetts. He buried New Port, Newburyport, Massachusetts. So all this has been going on for 40 years. Four years later, all these guys get together at the First Continental Congress. And when they get together, John Adams...
This is one of the guys who's there, and John Adams wrote his wife, Abigail, and told her what happened at the first, at, at the first Congress. He said, Abigail, he said, when the Congress first met, now you got to remember, these guys are coming from 13 different nations, not 13 states. Georgia had never met the guys from Massachusetts, and the guys from Pennsylvania didn't know who the guys from South Carolina were, and they didn't work as a nation. They were all 13 independent nations. It was like Europe. He said, Abigail, when Congress first met, Mr. Thomas Cushing of Massachusetts made a motion that it should be open with prayer. That's a good deal, except it was opposed by Mr. John Jay of New York and Mr. John Rutledge of South Carolina. Let's open prayer. We can't do that. Now, it's interesting. These two guys are two of the most religious guys in America. John Jay is a founder of the American Bible Society. He's president of the American Bible Society. These guys are hardcore Christians. They said, there is no way we're going to open Congress with prayer. Because they explained, they said, because we're so divided in religious sentiments. We have some Episcopalians and some Quakers and some Anabaptists and some Presbyterians and some congregants. We can't join together in the same act of worship. There is no way you're going to get all these denominations. We're not going to pray with you guys because we're not of your denomination. And at that point in time, what happened was Sam Adams had something to say. Sam Adams stood up to the group and he addressed the group. And Sam Adams said, he said, I'm no bigot. He said, this is John Adams reporting. He said, Mr. Sam Adams rose. He said he was no bigot. And he could hear a prayer from a gentleman of piety and virtue who was at the same time a friend to his country, Father Abraham. He kicked in and said, look, if you fear God and work righteousness, I'm happy to hear you pray. And so what happened was Sam Adams, who's a Congregationalist, actually asked for an Anglican minister, Jacob Duchesne, to come pray the prayer. And Congregationalists hated Anglicans. They were the number one enemy. And he said, look, if somebody fears God and works righteousness, if you love God and if you love America, I want you to pray. I'm going to listen to prayer. And that broke down the walls. And so what happened was they had that opening prayer in Congress based on the Father Abraham sermon. And John Adams told Ab, and by the way, the opening prayer in Congress ran for almost two hours. Now, they didn't want to pray at the start. But once Sam Adams broke through and said, Father Abraham, Oh yeah, got it. We all are one of the same body. A two-hour prayer session. It didn't stop there. John Adams wrote Abigail and said, Abigail, not only did we pray this morning, we studied four chapters of the Bible this morning in Congress. He said, God so spoke to us in one of those chapters, so built our faith that we now believe for the first time we can defeat the British in the coming conflict. And so he wrote Abigail. He said, Abigail, he said, I must beg you to read that psalm. It was Psalm 35. He said, Abigail, when we read Psalm 35 this morning, boy, did God show us. He spoke to us, and we now think we can win this conflict. He said, I beg you to read that psalm. Read the 35th psalm to your friends. Read it to your father. He said, we've even appointed a continental fast. Not only have we prayed, we're going to add fasting to it. He said, can you imagine the impact of 3 million Americans praying and fasting? Because that's what we had in America then, 3 million. He says, millions would be above their knees at once before their great creator, imploring his forgiveness and blessings to smiles on American council and arms. Now, that was the first time ever that Congress called the nation to prayer. And that call to prayer... That was one of 15 times that Congress called the nation to prayer during the American Revolution. And so much were we into calling people to pray that you'll find that by the time you get to 1815, there have been 1,400 government-issued calls to prayer in America. 1,400 times the government has called us to a time of prayer in America. We had one this past weekend. Um, President Trump called for a time of prayer for the disaster with, with Harvey. 1,400 times by 1815 we had done that. And when you look at that, let, let me show you some of the prayers. So for example, you take John Hancock. We all know John Hancock. Nobody knows about his faith today. He actually called his state to prayer on 22 different occasions. We own so many of his original prayer proclamations. I want you to see what John Hancock had the state of Massachusetts praying for. He's governor of Massachusetts. Look at the prayer request that he put out in his proclamations. Massachusetts, he said, let's pray that the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ may be established in peace and righteous among all the nations of the earth. What do you think would happen today if a governor had that prayer request for the people of his state? This is John Hancock. Here's another one. He says, let's pray that all nations may bow to the scepter of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and that the whole earth may be filled with his glory. He's got Massachusetts praying this. He's another prayer. He says, let's pray and confess our sins before God and implore his forgiveness through the merits and mediation of, our, of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Here's another one. Pray that the spiritual kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, may be continually increasing until the whole earth shall be filled with his glory. 
This is the kind of stuff that when the government issued calls to prayer back at that point in time. Another one of the founding fathers is Samuel Huntington. He was a general in the American Revolution, wanted to become the governor of Connecticut. He called his state to prayer. Matter of fact, look at this prayer proclamation for Connecticut. What's he got the state of Connecticut praying? He says, it becomes the people publicly to acknowledge the overruling hand of divine providence and their dependence on the supreme being as their creator and merciful preserver and with becoming humility and sincere repentance to supplicate his pardon that we may obtain forgiveness through the merits and mediation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You got everybody in Connecticut praying that prayer? Really? Yeah, this is real common. As a matter of fact, you'll find that Oliver Wolcott, a signer of the Declaration, he was a governor. He called his state to prayer with the same kind of rhetoric. Uh, Sam Adams, we know of Sam Adams. He was the governor of Massachusetts after John Hancock. He issued seven different prayer proclamations, often praying and fasting that people in the state would come to know Jesus. I mean, this was the tone that we had throughout American history that you'll never get in history today, and yet there's the actual documents. This is what actually happened. So when you look at the tone, by the time we get to 1781, now we win the American American Revolution, a, a conflict that nobody ever thought we could win. And so when we win it, it's two years later before the British signed the peace treaty. And when they did, when the British signed the peace treaty, George Washington handed in his letter of resignation. And in that letter, he says, and I have a, a letter I'm going to send to all the governors of the states telling you what I think now as commander in chief. We've spent eight years fighting this battle. We've won. And, and I've got some counsel that I want to impart to the governors. And Part of that, this is where he calls for the first Veterans Affairs Program. He calls for, for, for the government to help the veterans who have served in the field because they went three years without pay. I mean, these guys weren't fighting because they were getting paid. They were fighting because they loved the country and loved their neighbors and wanted to, wanted to save liberty for the people. And, and so Washington lays it all out, and we actually own the, the letter that he sent to the governors. We, the, the one that went to Connecticut we have. It's the last official address of George Washington to the legislatures of the United States. He's got 14 bosses, 13 state governors, and Congress. They're all his boss. So he has to resign from 14 different bodies, 14 different entities. And at the last of this address where he says, now we've won. We fought for eight years and we've won. It's interesting that this last part of his address, you see the last paragraph there right above his name, George Washington. This is what he says, I now make it my earnest prayer, and that whole paragraph is his prayer for all the governors and all the states of the United States. Really strong stuff that he has. This is the way we were, and this is a president who prayed and offered prayers. And in addition, let me take you through some other presidential prayers that we don't think much about today. Uh, for example, if you jump into World War II, we know, boy, what a blessing it was to hear this morning from a, a veteran who was there at all that happened. And, and I can't tell you how, how much of a blessing that was to me to hear that, but D-Day, what happened on D-Day with all the troops, all the nearly 5,800 ships that went in, 700 aircraft, etc. cetera. Uh, you've got this going on Juneau Beach and Gold Beach and Normandy and Omaha and Utah and all these various beaches that, that are going. As those guys are coming ashore, it's interesting to see what was happening back home because these guys are facing bullets um, with our artifacts that we have. We have the actual landing maps that were used. We have a number of the D-Day flags that were there. It's just, it's amazing to see from the soldier standpoint what was going on. Now, back home, this had been a secret just as we kept it a secret from, from the Germans. We didn't warm knowing where we were landing. We tried with intelligence, OSS and other things to make the Germans think we were landing somewhere else so they wouldn't have all their equipment right there. The logical place that we landed is where it was logical, but we tried to convince the Germans we were going somewhere else. So they took about half their equipment, moved it somewhere else in case we landed somewhere that wasn't logical. So as, as tough as it was on soldiers, it wasn't as tough as it would have been if we hadn't convinced the Germans that we were coming at a different point. So it's still tough for these guys coming in. And it's interesting what happened back home at that time. Because at that time, President Roosevelt has been giving addresses to the American people as fireside chats. And just the day before, he had told them about what happened with the fall of Italy, that Italy has fallen. So you get in these reports, and, and there's all this stuff going on where it looks like we're getting pounded. And Europe is getting pounded by the Nazis. But then he tells the American people, oh, by the way, yesterday when I talked to you, I didn't tell you, but right now we're landing in France. We, we have gone on the offensive. We're, and, and so what he does, I want you to hear a part of what, what President 
Roosevelt told the nation as these guys were landing at Normandy on D-Day. And so, in this poignant hour, I ask you to join with me in prayer. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight and cruel. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness in their faith. They will need thy blessings. Their road will be long and hard. For six and a half minutes, he, the president, led the nation in prayer. The nation joined him in prayer six and a half minutes. You can imagine what would happen today if a president prayed for six and a half minutes nationally and led the nation in prayer. That's what happened simultaneously with what was going in the military was back home. We've got all this prayer going. Now, as we get and, and move through the next six months and we end up with Battle of the Bulge, and by the way, General Patton with the Third Army issued a tremendous prayer card at that point in time. Uh, General James O'Neill, who was the chief of chaplains for the Third Army, they'd run up against bad weather and Battle of the Bulge. They couldn't get the skies to open up right. We could pound the German tanks. There were 1,800 German tanks, 250,000 Germans attacking through the, the top of the mountains there where they weren't supposed to be attacking. And that was the real weak point in Battle of the Bulge. And if we could get our planes in the air, we could pound the tanks, but we couldn't get the weather to cooperate. And so Patton calls General O'Neill in and says, have you got a prayer for weather? And General O'Neill, chief of chaplain, says, let me check. He checked there wasn't a prayer for weather. He said, I'll write one. He said that Patton went over to the window, stood and looked out the window. And as he looked out the window with his back to the chaplain, he said, chaplain, do our soldiers pray? He said, general, that's why we have chaplains. We have services. He said, no, no, no. I don't know. I didn't ask if the chaplains prayed. I asked if our soldiers prayed. He said, well, certainly, sir. I mean, there's no atheist in foxholes. Everybody pray. He says, no. I mean, do they really pray? He said, I want the soldiers of the Third Army praying. So what happened was General O'Neill wrote out a prayer for the weather. That prayer for the weather was on one side of the prayer card. On the other side was the Christmas greeting from General Patton signed by him to all the troops because Battle of the Bulge is Christmas time. And they distributed 250,000 of those prayer cards. They've been praying, they, they've been having almost a month of the heavens closed over where they can't get the planes off the ground. They issued those prayer cards to every soldier. They prayed. Two days later, the heavens opened up. We got the planes back in the air. We pounded the German tanks, and the battle went in a different direction. Had the Germans won the Battle of the Bulge, totally different outcome, or at least it would have prolonged what happened in World War II. So prayer going with General Patton for the Third Army. We have original prayer cards from General Patton that were done particularly for that. So you go through Battle of the Bulge. It's Christmas time, and it's interesting what President Roosevelt gave as Christmas cards to the White House staff. He took the D-Day prayer, and he printed it. It's, it's about 17, 18 inches high. It's probably about 12 inches wide. And that was the Christmas card for the White House that year, was the D-Day prayer. What a religious thing that is. Yeah, because that's the way we thought back then. Well, you go, and, and Roosevelt dies in office, and it's Truman that finishes out the war. And when Truman finishes out the war, he too calls America to a time of prayer and thanking God that this is over. We've been able to preserve liberty on the continents, both in the, on the east side and the west side, in the Japanese area as well as in the, the European area. And the next guy who becomes president had been the commander-in-chief of the European theater in World War II, and it's Eisenhower. Eisenhower is inaugurated as president, but Eisenhower says, as he went to communion service that morning before he was inaugurated, he said, I was thinking, he said, America is becoming too secular. What can I do to help America not be so secular? He said, I, he said I'm not a preacher. I, I can't preach a sermon. What can, I'm president. What, what can I do? He said, I know. I can lead the people in prayer. And so what happened was, at his own inauguration, he stepped up, and it was not on the program. It was not planned. It was not part of what went on. The reporters for the Washington Post replied, reported that when he started praying, everybody looked at the program and said, what, what the reporters looked at the program. All the people bowed their heads and prayed. I want you to see the prayer that, that, uh, that Eisenhower prayed. My friends, uh, before I begin the expression of those thoughts, 
that I deem appropriate uh, to this moment, would you permit me the privilege of uttering a little private prayer of my own? And I ask that you bow your heads. Almighty God, as we stand here at this moment, my associates in the, my future associates in the executive branch of government join me in beseeching that thou will make full and complete our dedication to the service of the people in this throng and their fellow citizens everywhere. Give us, we pray, the power to discern clearly right from wrong and allow all our words and actions to be governed thereby and by the laws of this land. Especially we pray that our concern shall be for all the people, regardless of station, race, or calling. May cooperation be permitted and be the mutual aim of those who, under the concepts of our Constitution, hold to differing political faiths, so that all may work for the good of our beloved country and thy glory. Amen. Interesting, that prayer that he prayed, he wrote out by hand. We actually have the actual original prayer that he prayed there at his inauguration. But he was concerned that America was becoming too secular. It's interesting to see what he did as president. We don't want America to become too secular. So shortly after becoming president, he initiated what's called the National Prayer Breakfast. Now it happens the first Thursday of every, uh, of, of every February. There is usually about seven to 8,000 people to come together. Over 140 nations come every year to D.C. where all of our civic leaders, all of our public officials, kings from other nations and heads of other nations come and we all pray together. That still goes on today. The National Prayer Breakfast. He also was, and by the way, the National Prayer Breakfast on the back of the program every year is this prayer from George Washington that I showed you earlier. It's such a killer prayer. George Washington said, you know, we, we won the revolution, but that's not going to make us happy. He said, if we don't imitate the divine characteristics of the author of our blessed religion, we'll never be a happy nation. He said, the only way we're going to be a happy nation is if we imitate Christ. That's in the prayer that Washington prayed for, for the nation at the end of the, the revolution. And that's the prayer that's on the back of the, the National Prayer Breakfast every year. In addition to that, in 1954, Eisenhower was at church at 10th Street Presbyterian Church. The Reverend George Docker is preaching that morning. And this is actually the sermon he was preaching. And he was from Scotland. And he said, you know, my kids came home from school this week. And I said, what'd you do at school? And they said, ah, the same thing we always do, Dad. And he said, well, I don't know what you do in American schools. Tell me what they do in American schools. He said, well, we start the day out and we have scripture and we have Bible reading. We say the Pledge of Allegiance. You say, you say the what? The Pledge of Allegiance. What's the Pledge of Allegiance? Well, we, we pledge to the American flag. What's, what's that pledge say? And they recited it to him, and he listened to it, and he thought about it for the rest of the week. He said, you know, he said, a Russian under Stalin could say that pledge the way an American does because they, they say they want liberty and justice for all, and they say they're one nation undivided. He said a communist could say that pledge. He, he said, that shouldn't be. He said, what makes America different is God. We ought to have God in our pledge. And so that morning, he preached a sermon. And you see here, under God, he's, he, he told the story of what his kids did. And he asked the kids, he said, we need to put under God in our pledge. Well, Eisenhower sitting on the front row of the pews there, 10th Street Presbyterian. And there's a bunch of senators and reps. And the next morning, they go in and introduce a bill to add under God to the Pledge of Allegiance. And, and actually, he signed that bill. I mean, it came right out of a sermon that was preached. What makes, God, what makes America different from other nations? God. Well, let's make sure we acknowledge that. Then in 1954, we added a special room to the U.S. Congress, a prayer room, where the, we do nothing but pray in there. It's dedicated for congressmen to go pray, and it gets a lot of use has a picture of George Washington kneeling in prayer at Valley Forge with Psalm 16.1 around him. Preserve me, O Lord, for in thee do I put my trust. Then you find that in 1956, he said, we've had in God we trust in our coins. We need it on every bit of money that comes out of the treasury. So we added in God we trust to every, every bit of currency that comes out of the treasury. Um, the same year, he said, let's make in God we trust our national life. See, this is all the stuff Eisenhower is doing because he thought America was too secular back then. Man, look where we are today. You know, what a change it's been. So you look at all the presidents that we've had and all the things that have gone around. Let me close by going back to our first president, George Washington. 
the first time George Washington called the nation to prayer, and we actually have the proclamation that Washington had for that, that call to prayer. You can go on our website at wallbuilders.com. You can see all these original proclamations. Why would George Washington call the nation to a time of prayer? He says why in the first paragraph. This is what Washington explains. He says, it is the duty of all nations, and by the way, notice the word duty. The word duty today is defined as doing that which one ought to do. The word duty in their dictionaries is a legally binding contractual obligation. It's a whole lot different than what we think of today. Washington said it is a legally binding contractual obligation of nations to do four things. What is it nations have a legally binding contractual obligation to do? He said, number one, to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God. Number two, to obey His will. Number three, to be grateful for His benefits. And number four, humbly to implore His protection and favor. That's the duty of nations. Nothing secular about this at all. See, that's why we had those 1,400 government-issued calls to prayer by 1815, because we knew that was key. And while you see that prayer and faith has been a real part of our nation, you know, it's not just any faith. It, it really is the, the Christian faith. If I take Roger Sherman, Roger Sherman's the only founding father to sign all four founding documents. He's the third most active member at the Constitutional Convention. He's the guy who came up with the bicameral system whereby we have a House and a Senate, and he came up with the Electoral College whereby not just the people get a vote, but the states get a vote. vote. States get to have a voice in choosing a president. So if it wasn't for that, you just run up the East Coast and down the West Coast, all the big cities would choose the president. Do you know there's enough population in the states of New York and states of Illinois and the states of California, those three states have more people in those states than the number of people that voted for the winning candidate in the last presidential election. If it wasn't for the Electoral College, three states could choose the president of the United States. Electoral College gives every state a voice. He's the guy who did it. But guess what? He's also a dedicated Christian. You read his political writings, you find things like this. He says, God commands all men everywhere to repent. He also commands them to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and has assured us that all who do repent and believe shall be saved. God has promised to bestow eternal blessings on all those who are willing to accept him on the terms of the gospel. That is in a way of free grace through the atonement. And we're told today the Founding Fathers are a bunch of atheists, agnostics, and deists. That's because we don't have a clue who they are. There's 250 Founding Fathers. We deal with university kids all the time. I've never had any university in America name more than two of the Founding Fathers out of the 250. And the two they name are Franklin and Jefferson, the two least religious Founding Fathers. So we know about them. We don't have a clue. Guys like Roger Sherman, guys like Benjamin Rush. He was, John Adams said he's one of the three most notable Founding Fathers. He said, you got George Washington, Ben Franklin, Benjamin Rush, never heard of the guy. He's a huge guy in our history, but he started the first Sunday school movement and the first Bible society in, in America, by the way. Look at what he says in his writings. He says, my only hope of salvation is the infinite, transcendent love of God manifested to the world by the death of his son upon the cross. Nothing but his blood will wash away my sins. I rely exclusively upon it. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. That's one of the three most significant founders. No wonder we don't study him today. And you got the same thing with John Witherspoon. John Witherspoon signed of the Declaration. He trained one-third of the founding fathers. He's president of Princeton. One-third of those founding fathers were students in his classes. He is the most famous gospel minister in his generation. More than a dozen volumes of gospel sermons. And look at what he had as, as part of what he just regularly puts out. This is what he's telling people. He says... I entreat you in the most earnest manner to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, for there is no salvation in any other, Acts 4.12. If you're not reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, if you're not clothed with the spotless robe of His righteousness, you must forever perish. I mean, this is the message we used to get even from our political leaders. See what a different tone America has taken in recent years, and we don't even know this history anymore. There is so much back there. There is a reason. You see, we sing things today like, God bless America. My gosh, if we want God bless America, give them something to work with. You know, back then, we had something to work with. You know, we, we, we kept calling people to remember God and, and, and remember in prayer and praying fast. And, and so that's God's providential history. He does get involved. When His people pray, He will respond. That's the lesson we have throughout history. So... 
that's what I wanted to share with you this morning, kind of see God's hand in history, get us not thinking so secular. You know, we got the same problem today that Eisenhower is facing, except we're a lot more secular today than he was back then. But look at all the measures they did to keep God-conscious people in America. And that's what we want, is to be God-conscious, and not just God-conscious, but Christ-conscious. I mean, I can take you through the rest of the Founding Fathers and show you so many others, dozens and dozens and dozens who had the same message. If this stuff seems new to you and you've never seen this before, um, we've got so much of this stuff that history reprinted and, and history that's, that's restored on the website. Um, we've also got what's called the Founder's Bible. It takes the Bible verse of the Founding Fathers use. So if you get interested in this stuff, you'll find, find it outside on the table. But let me just remind you to be God conscious. Don't compartmentalize your faith away from what you do. And particularly be Christ conscious because that is what has made America unique of all nations in the world. God bless you guys. Thanks for letting me share. Thank you, David. All right, give me a, a minute and a half. Bear with me a minute and a half. We do this every year. If you will look in the center of all your tables, there will be an envelope there. Inside are some blue cards. If somebody would grab that envelope and, and share the cards around. If you, this is, uh, uh, we would love for you to fill these out to sort of register there. Uh, feel, feel it's quite okay if you don't want to do that. Uh, there's some questions there. I'm not going to read all these things to you, but there's some questions there. If some of this has application to you today. Please check that. Uh, if you would like to leave your email, uh, we would be contacting you occasionally, announcing uh, different events that happen. So if you would, just take a couple minutes and, and look that over and fill it out. And while you do that, I'll make some quick announcements. As we're coming towards the close of our program, uh, one, this today has been videoed. If you would like to see it again, if you give us a day or two, it will show up on ministrytomen.net. You can check in on it again. Uh, we thank Bot Radio. They've been a partner of ours for a long time. They, they interviewed David a couple of times in the past few weeks. They interviewed our chairman, Dennis Banker. Um, they will have uh, this Saturday and Sunday on 91.5 91 FM. Um, you can hear David again at 1 p.m. and at 3.30 p.m. on Sunday on 13.20 a.m. You can hear him again at 4.30 and 2. And Bot Radio also carries the Wall Builders program, which I, I believe is a weekly program. I've forgotten what day. I think it's at 5.30 um, on Bot Radio. So um, if you be like me and you'll forget those times, all you have to do is do what all the kids do today. You Google it and you got it. A uh, couple of other quick announcements uh, immediately following. There's tables set up outside. Uh, Brian will have his music out there. I think he's recorded seven or eight CDs over the year. It's fantastic music. I have all of them. I download it on my phone so I can listen to them at any time. Uh, David will have a, a uh, table out there also with several of his books. So take the opportunity to stop by and purchase uh, some books, some music, and enjoy. Well, working towards a close, a bit of history. The year was 1938. It was not a particularly joyous time in America. We're still in the middle of the Great Depression, and there are a lot of rumblings over in Europe about a guy named Hitler. This was pre-TV. This was the time when families would gather around in the living room in the evenings. They would gather around their radio, 
and they would listen to their favorite radio programs. One of their favorite programs was the Kate Smith Hour. Kate Smith was a popular singer. She was not only a popular singer, she was very patriotic. The 20th anniversary of Armistice Day, which we recognize today as Veterans Day, but the 20th anniversary of Armistice Day was coming up. Armistice Day being the signing of the treaty to end World War I. So as the 20th anniversary was coming up, she wanted to do something special on her program. She wanted to sing a special song. So she went to a friend of hers named Irving Berlin. She told him what she'd like to have, and she asked him if he would write a song for her. He said, I have just the thing. And he went to his files, and he pulled out a song that he had written 20 years previous. Never published, but he wrote the song, stuck it back in the file, and it remained there for 20 years. So picture with me now, if you can, Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people huddled in living rooms all across the United States listening to November the 11th, 1938, listening for the very first time to this song, to these words.
remain standing. Why don't we make, why don't we individually make that our prayer? God, bless America. And why don't we individually do our part to make that happen? Do our part to heal our nation. I joined Ralph when he said he's proud to be an American. I am too. I'm proud to be a part of this community and walk among some of the greatest people on the face of the earth and call them friend. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for being here. May God richly, richly bless your lives. We'll see you in the community, and we'll see you next year. You are dismissed.